Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat, the regular roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. I have three books to talk about this week, shall we crack on with it? Sophie vlogs. First up is a teeny tiny one. This is A Cup of Sake Beneath the Cherry Trees by Kenko, and it's translated by Meredith McKinney. So Yoshida Kenko was a uh, Japanese monk living in about the 1200s. Yes, born 1283, died 1352. This is a selection of excerpts from Essays on Idleness. It was an interesting read. I'm not sure I'll read the full Essays on Idleness because I do feel like this selection gave me sort of everything I would have wanted to get from it. There are some really beautiful moments in this that are like reflective contemplation, specifically in regards to like contemplating nature um, and some more like spiritual questions and stuff like that. I felt like those were like really beautiful and really lovely to read. I think my main thing coming out of this is I feel like this has real contradictions in it that I'm not sure that he intended. But I do wonder if sort of the editor of this did intend to highlight those. There are moments like, for example, one of them is just to do with the concept of alcohol and drinking sake. So there's, there's a whole extract about how terrible it is when you go to a party and the host will not stop forcing sake upon all the guests and how horrendous their drunkenness is. And um, he, he quotes the Buddha and he says, you know, the Buddha says, that if a drop of alcohol passes your lips, you'll spend 5,000 years without hands. And he, he really goes in about how terrible it is. And then there's like a different extract. And then the next extract was him talking about all of those moments where it's just really lovely to share a cup of sake with a friend beneath the cherry trees. And then also how nice it is when one's host singles one out and makes them feel special by topping up their glass and never letting it go down. And how fun it can be to be drunk. And I was just like, did you hear yourself? Did you hear yourself narry two extracts ago? <laughs> Um, he also had a lot of opinions to do with women that I just fundamentally disagreed upon, specifically to do with, like, the way relationships between men and women were. Again, a lot of it was very contradictory, but also a lot of it I just felt like was not understanding women as, like, fully fleshed out human beings. Um, so it was an interesting read. I gave it three out of five stars because I'm definitely glad I read it because it was an insight into a time period and a point of view that I don't feel like I've really ever read anything from before, so that was really fun. It's just also I was like, I'm not really surprised that I don't agree with everything this guy is saying because lots of time has passed, our situations are different. Um, so yeah, an interesting read for sure. After that is The Testament of Loki by Joanne M. Harris. This is kind of the fourth book in this series but also kind of not so there was an original duology that is rune marks and rune light which were published a while ago that are like a ya fantasy duology that is like exploring the norse gods um i really enjoyed both of those books i thought they were really great actually the first book from this that i read was the gospel of loki which is sort of set before those it's it's a retelling of the poetic edda so it's a retelling of these norse myths but from the perspective of loki and I did a review of it and I'll link the review down below. Now that time has passed since writing that review, I think I was a lot kinder towards the narrative style than I actually now feel because essentially a lot of people are going to love the narrative style of that because Loki is very like witty and sarcastic and he uses all these words like your humble narrator and stuff like this, which some people will love. I actually found very irksome. The Testament of Loki is also a prequel to the Rune Light duology. This one sort of explains how the gods got from the fall of Ragnarok to where they are at the start of that series. So at the start of the Rune Mark series, the gods have fallen, Ragnarok has happened, but obviously in order for the story to happen, they are still somehow present. This really bridges the gap between Ragnarok and the start of that series. For the first hundred pages, I really did not like this book and I was going to give it two stars. And then I settled in and it got better. And the main thing is, is this has Loki as a narrator again and I don't like Loki's narration style. A lot of people will. I do understand that this is a me thing. This was less, it had less of that like your humble narrator thing, but it did still have a lot of that tone and that thing which I just found so annoying. Um, essentially, Loki, from this point of imprisonment, sort of goes through this video game and then manages to like find a human host. 
and I really did not like a lot of the stuff when he was just new in his host because there's a whole th thing that I found a bit gross about he's essentially in the body of a teenage girl and he's like touching it all up and like assessing the body and equally there's a lot of stuff about him like taking control of the body and then also trying to access a lot of um, her memories and stuff like this and I just really didn't like that I didn't really like it was being done in a very like flippant humorous way but I was like oh issues of consent my dude um, so I didn't like that as this went on I settled in a lot more and I did end up having a fun time I like Joanne M. Harris as a writer in general so I, I always go into her books wanting to like them and I think when I just accepted that I wasn't going to like the tone and also when the story kicked into gear a bit because there's a lot of like settling in at this start point where it's like okay well we're in this different world he doesn't know what pizza is and then eventually we reach a point where we get more into the plot um, because reading this having read rune marks I know where he ends up so I know what the end point of this has to be so there are characters that I know sort of how they're going to end up because like I've read that series and this comes after so I think it just took a while for it it took a hundred pages or so for it to sort of get through all this setup and then actually get into like a similar sort of plot line that Rune Marks has where it's like there are double crossings happening maybe some people are not who you think they are and that sort of thing and then it settled into also some of the stuff that she does that I really like which is looking at like the power of stories and and this sort of thing so in the end I did end up liking this I gave it a three out of five stars definitely prefer that original duology to these two books that come after but I do think that this is a tone and a style that is going to work for a lot of people and there will be lots of people who like this so you know sometimes it's just a you thing finally I also read on my kindle The Wrath and the Dawn by Renee Adier which is sort of a retelling of Shahrazad. I think it's also got elements of Aladdin in but I'm not sure if that's going to come into play more in the second book so this follows Shahrazad. she's volunteered to marry the guy in charge who um, every morning strangles his wife to death. Typical Shahrazad setup, she starts telling him stories, he's hooked, um, and then it sort of like builds from there. This is another book that I find myself a little bit torn on. There were things I really liked about this. First of all, I did find it compulsively readable. I read this in like, if not 24 hours, then 48 hours, and it's like a 400 page book. I read it so quickly, and I got really immersed, and in the world felt really real to me. Shazzy is also quite a compelling heroine in many ways, like she's very strong-minded, she's very determined, and she feels a lot, she feels a lot deeply, and I found a lot of that really sympathetic. Khalid, who is the love interest, who is also the guy who's been killing people, um, I think the thing about this relationship is, is that like, from the start, you have a sense that there's a reason behind this. There must be something that is potentially going to mean that he's not a monster. I found like, because we took such a long time to find out what that thing was, I found it very hard to root for this relationship because it all happens quite quickly, like literally like by like day three they're in love, which is fine, you know, fast paced books, whatever. But like Shazzy's motivation is that her best friend is one of these people who married him who got strangled. And I think the fact that we don't really get a lot of backstory on her is kind of what made this a bit tricky for me. She keeps feeling very guilty and very torn because her best friend died and that sort of thing and it was his fault but she has these feelings for him but we never we get like one flashback of her and her best friend's relationship and I wish we'd had more because I think I would have felt more rooted in all of this distress if I'd known who this character was, obviously I can understand the concept that if your best friend gets murdered you're going to be very emotional about it, but also like I just wish I knew who that person was because she's so central to the story but she's also so absent from the story. Because we don't get this information about why he's doing this for such a long time it feels really tricky to root for it. Also specifically because, and this isn't a spoiler because this happens like straight away, they do sleep together when he comes to visit her at night but you find out that he doesn't do that with any of the other girls and I found that very tricky because um, that's like there's no consent here in this relationship, you know. Like, um, like technically she's consenting because she like wants has plans to bump him off, but also like I just I, I wish that that hadn't been an aspect. I wish that he'd gone and she'd told him stories, and that would have been it, or that if that was going to happen, it was something that was addressed because it's not really addressed and it's just kind of left and then you're you have these characters who fall for each other who are so dedicated to each other 
and then they have these consensual moments with each other that while they're having these consensual moments it's just reminding me of these first few nights and then it, make, it makes me feel really conflicted so like that's something that I think is an innate difficulty when you're dealing with the Shahrazad story if you want to have it as a romance I feel like it's something that is so tricky to navigate because like the very nature of this story is that you have to deal with like lack of consent and also murdering and then how do you also make that person sympathetic if you're withholding the information for such a long amount of time about why they're doing the thing also there is a third character called Tariq and they're kind of setting up like a love triangle here um but Tariq really annoyed me <laughs> because he's very impulsive and whereas Khalid as this relationship develops Khalid is very actually like listens to Shahrazad and like her choice and what she wants to do becomes quite important and Tariq really does not do that he's just like I'm gonna save her doesn't matter what she thinks type thing and I found that a bit annoying but I don't want this to sound like I hated this book because there were things I really liked about it. I found the world building really interesting. I think the second book is going to be very interesting because there has been so much set up in this first book and where it ends um, things are poised to really kick into gear with more magic elements happening, with more like wider political ramifications happening and that sort of thing. So I think the second book potentially is going to be super interesting. I definitely will give it a read at some point. Um, I just, it's one of those that I find myself like a bit conflicted about when I actually sit and think about, but at the same time I can't deny that I raced through it and I had a fun time reading it. I realise that all three of these are books that I kind of have like mixed feelings of. I think that that lends them to discussions quite well, so if you'd like to have a talk about any of these in the comments down below I'd really love to hear from you, um, especially these ones that I'm particularly torn on. Have you read them? Did you love them? Did you hate them? I'd love to hear like all sides of this just because, you know, it's really interesting, especially on things that you're a bit conflicted about to get other people's perspectives and see what their reading experiences were like. I hope you're having a lovely day, I will see you next time for something different.